before there's hope for tomorrow, we must first embark on the darkest hour. Welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Tonight's experiences might come from different people. They may even be about different things. But whether it's a warm visit from the deceased or a terrifying encounter with the living, each of these experiences will leave you feeling something. So... Let's get started, shall we? On Halloween night of 2006, I had myself the realest scare of my life. Some backstory, I was living with my parents at the time, traditionally as a household, We didn't participate in the whole trick-or-treating thing, mainly because our house is down a long dead-end road, one that is off another road that eventually turns into a dead end as well. Our closest neighbors were a good three-quarter mile away from us. We also had our own tradition of buying a giant bag of candy and going to the movies while everyone else was out trick-or-treating. As I got slightly older, I enjoyed staying back while my parents went out for a little date night. I would bundle up in the bonus room, which was meant as our theater room, with blackout curtains, a comfy, comfy couch, and I would watch the scariest movie I could find. So it's Halloween night. My parents had gone out to dinner and likely would go to a movie after. I had chosen to hang back and would be watching Wolf Creek. As I headed downstairs to get my popcorn from the microwave, I thought I heard the familiar, quiet beeping sound The sound the alarm system would make when it wasn't armed, but something was opened, like a window or a door. Then I thought, no. I was just hearing the microwave beeping. It gave me a good reminder to set the alarm, though. My parents always reminded me to do that before they left or whenever they knew I would be home alone. And I would usually forget, sometimes only remembering after they would call to say they were on their way home. So I armed the system, and I headed upstairs with all of my goods, making sure that all the lights were off as to add to the scariness of it all, and really to detour any sort of trick-or-treaters who may for some reason have thought it was a good idea to come all the way out here. I was about halfway through the movie when I had to pee, and I was that fun sort of scared as I walked through the dark to the bathroom across the landing. While in the bathroom, I got this strange feeling. Had I not just seen the outside light on? Was I scaring myself or was the outside motion detected light on? Maybe my parents were home. I don't know exactly what it was, but I couldn't bring myself to leave the bathroom right away. After washing my hands, I just stood there and thought, I was for sure scaring myself, but... Wouldn't it be fun to pretend that I wasn't scaring myself and that I had to act in a smart way? A way that would conceal that I was here at all. I was trying to take my mind off of the negative vibes I was feeling by giving myself this pep talk. And just as I turned the light off, I heard the ear-piercing sound of the alarm system. I made no noise, but I was sure that my heart was going to pump right out of my chest or throat, or whatever. I was instantly overheating, shaming myself inside my head for not grabbing my cell phone from the cup holder before going to the bathroom. Just a quick trip, I thought. 
I knew the alarm would alert the police, but I also knew that they weren't just down the road. They were at least 10 minutes away on a good night. This was Halloween night. I had decided I was going to leave the bathroom, but I couldn't go back to the theater room. The room's light was on. You couldn't see that from the outside, but if I opened the door, you'd see the light fill the upstairs. I needed darkness, total darkness. I needed to get to my parents' room. It had the best view of the house perimeter. It had a phone, and most importantly, it had a balcony. There was no ladder to get from the lower level to the top, but my parents had a metal foldable fire escape ladder that was inside the outdoor ottoman. I could hear what sounded like someone moving furniture around, and I was sure they were going through the entertainment center drawers and my dad's office. How many of them were there, I thought. I needed to get out of the space before they decided to make their way upstairs. With the bathroom light off, I slowly opened the door. I remember having a moment to think, and, and I actually thanked the door for opening so quietly. Then I decided to take off my slippers as my socks would glide best on the floors, without noise. I stepped out of them and crept towards my parents' room. The outside motion detector lights were on, and also one set of kitchen lights now. Instantly, I knew that they'd had to have come through the back door, but I swore that I had locked that earlier. But we had, like, six different light switches for the various lights downstairs, and the set that was illuminating now was the switch closest to the back door. The alarm was so loud, I decided to pick up my pace and run towards my parents' balcony. I threw on my mom's coat, and I opened the door and went straight for the ottoman. My plan was to climb down and run into the greenhouse. It wasn't really connected to the house. It had its own phone line. I didn't need a key since I knew where the spare was. I went to throw the escape ladder over the side. When I met eyes with someone... They were standing there frozen, like I was at first. But then, they started to make noise, screaming. Likely to his comrades that were rummaging through my downstairs at that moment. Maybe he was yelling for them to leave. Someone was home, time to get out. But I knew I couldn't take that chance. I dropped the ladder and ran towards my parents' bedside table. There was a phone, and hopefully, my dad's gun. I knew I absolutely wasn't supposed to touch it, unless it was an emergency. Well, this was that. But God damn it. Did I even know how to use it properly? Could I right now? I found myself running, dialing my parents' number immediately. I figured the police were on their way, so I needed my parents to know what was going on. I also hoped maybe they were closer. Right around the corner, even. It rang endlessly. I sat the phone down, going through the side drawer. No gun. But there was my dad's giant, hunting-style knife, so I grabbed that thing. As I ran towards the bedroom door to close it and lock it up, I heard the sound of someone coming up the stairs. It didn't sound like they were running. They were walking slowly. I quickly but quietly closed the French doors and locked them. Then I went back to the phone... Dad's voicemail. I hung up, and just as I went to dial Mom, bang, bang, bang. Three loud thumps against the bedroom door, and I accidentally shrieked because I was surprised. I hadn't heard anyone get that close at all. Had they seen me close the door? I heard someone yell incoherently through the door, but I was making my way to the bathroom. There was a small window, likely too far off the ground to jump, but at least it would put another door between us. My mind went to the worst-case scenario. Clearly, they were going to kill me or rape me or both. Why wouldn't they have just left by now? Surely they thought the police were on their way. The alarm was still blaring. Hadn't it been at least ten minutes by now? So many things run through your head in those kinds of moments. 
I was now locked in the bathroom, but I could still hear the banging coming from the bedroom door. I made my way to the bathtub, stepping up on the side to peer out the window. I couldn't see any police lights, people, or any lights, really. Why weren't the motion sensor lights on? Were they all inside the house? Bang, bang, bang. I just kept hearing on repeat. They haven't made it inside the room yet, I thought to myself. This was my chance to run and call the police with my parents' bedroom phone. Maybe the alarm had not alerted them, after all. I took a deep breath and I opened the bathroom door with one hand, gripping the knife in the other, and I darted towards the phone. Just as my open hand grabbed the receiver, I heard the sound of wood cracking and breaking. Small bits of wood fell near my feet, and I was practically face to face with three guys, two of which were wearing full ski masks, and one was only covering half his face until he pulled it down when he saw me. I flung my knife in front of me, holding it tightly. I watched three of them jump back slightly and could see that they weren't armed, at least not visibly. I grabbed the phone while still making eye contact, and before I could hit 911, two of them lunged forward right at me. I saw the third man turn and run around the top floor frantically, as though he was looking for something. As the two men charged me, I instantly swung forward with the knife, and they jumped back again, yelling, Whoa, chill. He sounded young. And then I heard the other one say, Yeah, chill. Who else is here? He sounded a little older, but still young. I looked back and forth at each of them, pointing the knife at each of them. I was trying to slow step further away from them and closer to the bathroom. Then... They each take turns telling me that they aren't going to hurt me. I looked at all three of them, telling them to just get the f out of here, yelling that the police are on their way. They looked at each other and then suddenly they were rushing me again. I held the knife out, and one of them tried to run out of reach, out of view behind me. I knew they were trying to split my attention, but I just held tight to the knife and I made a run for the bathroom. I felt one of them grab my arm, and I reached back, swinging the knife rapidly, not caring and almost hoping that I would cut someone. I couldn't believe that this was happening, but if it was, I definitely wasn't going down without a fight. I felt the knife make contact, and one of them screamed in pain, and just as they did, I felt my arm release, and I ran to the bathroom knife still in hand. While taking a deep breath, I tried to reassure myself that they weren't that big, but there were three of them. I looked down at the knife, which had some blood on it. I stood there, just staring at the door, looking at the window, thinking, am I going to try to get out through there, through that? I couldn't. There was no way I was going to leave myself vulnerable like that if they burst this door down. So I continued to stand there and essentially braced myself. Bang, bang, bang. The familiar sound. These guys were relentless. I was scared, but I kept standing, bracing myself. Their screams were more aggressive now, telling me to open the fucking door and get their friend some band-aids. I told them to more or less fuck off. And then suddenly, it was silent. The alarm was no longer sounding. It had somehow been shut off. Then the guys started to talk over each other, one of them getting pretty loud, followed by them all shushing one another. Suddenly, I hear footsteps, lots of them. First, it was coming from downstairs. Then the ones that were outside my door from the three men moved toward the balcony. I heard from my right the men struggling with the escape ladder, but also someone was now running up the stairs. If it was police, I was hoping they were running in my direction. 
The footsteps grew closer. The men didn't sound like they had made it very far. I heard police officers yelling for the men to drop everything, hands behind their head, and to get down. All the while, I just stood there, nervously, wondering if I should call out. But before I had a chance, I heard more banging on the bathroom door, but this time followed by... Hello? Police? Is anyone in there? I went to yell out, but nothing came out. I didn't realize how scared I was until then. My throat was so tight, my chest so tight. I couldn't even make a noise. Another bang on the door, I jumped. The officer called out again. If someone is in there, I need you to respond. I took a deep breath and I managed to squeeze out a yes, I'm in here. I was getting the hang of speaking again and continued, I live here, this is my house. They asked if I was armed or if I was hurt, and then if I would unlock the door. I looked down at my hand, still clenching the knife, white-knuckling it, really. I dropped the knife and I kicked it towards the toilet. Then I told them I was not armed, there's a knife in here, but I tossed it, and I'm not injured. Then I went to unlock the door, and when I opened it, there were two police officers a man and a woman. The three men weren't immediately in view, but the one man's blood was. It was on the door, my parents' floor, the mirrors. I didn't realize I had even cut someone deep enough to create such a scene. The female officer took me downstairs, and as I walked down the stairs, I couldn't believe what a wreck the entire house was. I was completely shocked to see that our TV from the living room was gone. My dad's office was trashed. The kitchen and guest room drawers were completely emptied. Anything valuable likely gone while everything else was scattered across the floor. I tried to keep my focus, listening to the officer telling me to try my parents again. But after we couldn't reach them, we moved forward with me giving a statement. At the time, I wasn't quite 18, so I don't even know if it was legal. But it wouldn't matter, since my parents came home shortly after we started. They were a complete wreck. My parents hadn't turned their phones back on after the movie, so when they pulled up to the driveway full of police cars in a random truck, they assumed the worst. When they came through the front door, it's like it all hit me then and all three of us were bursting out into tears, my mom frantically asking what happened while my dad calmly sidestepped over to the police officer, asking in a more even tone what had happened. We all sat down. I finished my statement. My parents refrained from playing the blame game when it came to what door was unlocked. Towards the end of the night, before the police left, they told my parents while I overheard that the back door was locked. They pulled me over to ask if I had locked it, but I told them I hadn't gone near anything since the alarm had sounded, but I thought I had locked it earlier. They asked my parents about the door on the side of the house, the one that's attached to the garage. I never used this door, but my parents did. My dad thought it was possible that he left that one unlocked, but it should have sounded the alarm when someone opened it even if it wasn't locked, because the system was armed. The officer said that door was unlocked, that they'd think the men spent most of their time in the garage, as it seemed like that's where most of our stuff was missing from. They had just loaded it directly into their truck. The police said that they saw several sets of footprints, footprints that seemed to carry through the garage and the house. Then the police started talking about five guys, when I had only known about three of them. How long had these guys been here? There was a lot of wreckage and missing stuff for this to all have taken place in what I considered 15 minutes maximum. Had they been in here since before the alarm had gone off? Had they gotten in before I armed the system? 
I started to get chills. When I'd heard that initial beep, the one that made me arm the system to begin with, what if that was the men entering the side door into the garage? Then they must have started in there, and by the time they would have wanted to ransack the inside, the system was armed, which would have sounded the alarm when they entered the home from the garage. If that's the case, and I don't see what other case there could be, that means that I was alone in my house with three to five strange men for much longer than I was even aware of. Regardless, I feel incredibly lucky that my parents bothered with an alarm system, that I bothered to arm it, and mostly that my dad always has some sort of weapon around. I still watch scary movies alone, even on Halloween, because you can't let people scare you from doing what you love. However, I stay away from films that depict my experience all too closely. My own memories and Halloween itself are a gruesome reminder enough of what was and what could have been. I was pretty young when this happened, but it happened two years in a row. Two years that I experienced the same thing. It definitely makes it harder to just brush it off. Of course, by now, nothing unsettling like it has happened, so I'm comfortable to share it as just a past experience of mine. Terrifying, but in the past, nonetheless. Though I was only six at the time, I was exposed to a good amount of horror as a child. My older brother was very much into death metal and anything that was bloody and gory. So I actually wasn't afraid of that kind of stuff. I wasn't sitting up watching Friday the 13th every night, but I wasn't not allowed to watch things if they were on the TV during normal waking hours. So I was six and it was Halloween. I was just getting into bed after having gone trick-or-treating when I heard a horrible screeching sound, and it was coming from the hall closet. It was right next to my mom and dad's bedroom, so I called out to them, asking what that was. They responded to me, asking what I was talking about. They didn't hear a thing, which really freaked me out. I slowly got out of bed, and then I ran to the hall closet. It sounded like something small, was scratching from inside there. I thought it might be a kitten, of course, because I was six, so I opened the door. But it was normal closet stuff. All except there was one yellow metal box that I'd never seen before. I opened it, and when I did, I almost screamed. It was a doll, a shitty doll. And by shitty, I mean it was very raggedy, possibly dirty, very ugly and very old doll. The hair was in two tangled braids with missing patches. I slowly picked the doll up, and when I did, it let out a scream. And this time I did too. I'd learned the doll was my brother's, that he absolutely wasn't getting rid of it. From that night on, the thought of it lurked in my mind. I spent the whole year believing that it was connected to Halloween somehow because it happened on that night. The following year, on Halloween, I had the same encounter with it. When everything happened again that year, I begged my brother to throw it away. He refused, but he was going to try to sell it. He took it from the closet and kept it in his room. For a while, I thought it was him messing with me. It had to have been a week later, and I'd gone into the closet to get my jump rope, when something yellow caught my eye. It was the yellow box. 
I picked it up and I opened it, and chills ran down my spine. Why was the doll back in here? I asked my brother why he wouldn't just keep it in his room as he said he would. He looked at me, shocked. Then, he looked under his bed quickly. He asked me how I did that. How did I get that from his room when he hadn't left? When he'd just seen it. I told him I'd just found it in the closet. This was finally enough to convince my brother to get rid of the doll. So he ended up donating the doll to a second-hand store. And rather inopportunely, I guess it became someone else's problem. My father passed away just before my daughter's first birthday. It was truly special that he got to meet her. My favorite picture of the two of them is from when she was just about three days old. He's holding her, smiling the most peaceful smile, as he looks down at her little face sleeping, wrapped up like a teeny tiny glow worm. We keep it framed and sitting on our bedroom dresser with our other special photos. About two years after he passed, we found out that I was pregnant with our son. It was an especially emotional pregnancy for me. My mom had passed when I was much younger, so not having my father this round was going to be really hard. I wanted him to meet our son, and it felt strange bringing my child into this world when I had no parents left of my own. I let go of a lot of that sadness. Whatever was left was just me missing him, and I really enjoyed that pregnancy, treasured watching my daughter light up as she felt her brother kick. It was wild. Fast forward to one of our last ultrasounds, which happened to fall on my birthday, and I was gifted with an incredible gift. My late father had made an appearance on my son's ultrasound. It's when you look at the photo of him and my daughter next to the sonogram that you really see the face looking down with that same smile at this new little peanut. I keep the two photos next to one another on our dresser, forever grateful that he did get to meet both of my children somehow, some way. So, Kevin, my daughter tells me you're in a band? Uh, yeah, I play guitar. We're pretty... Guitar, huh? Yeah, I used to play guitar for a punk rock band. We were more crust punk, though. We were, we were pretty, pretty edgy back then. People didn't like us that much, but... Actually, I think I got one of our tapes lying around if, if you want to take a listen. Um, sure. Oh, here it is. Check this out, Kevin. <laughs> me and the boys called this song Commercial Break. Neo Retro FM, live from Olympia, Washington. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Modern music programming. NeoRetroFM.com Are you afraid of the dark? Well, don't be. Instead, grab yourself a candle. Not just any candle, though. Grab yourself a seance. Or pure hate. Decide for yourself as you browse. The Candle Collection by Forget-Me-Not. There's a little something for everyone. You'll see. Visit ConductedByForgetMeNot.com to learn more about this collection. Kevin, did you like that one? Yeah, I, I, why not? Those were the days. Oh my goodness, those were the days. You want to hear, you want to hear one more, Kevin? You want to hear one more? Okay. Yeah, this, we, I would say this is our most pop song. Before our lead singer died, he called it more stories. Here we go. My partner and I live on the West Coast now. 
We both grew up on farms in different states on the eastern side of the U.S. And similarly, we couldn't wait to get out when it came time to go to college. The story doesn't take place in Oregon, though. I have yet to experience anything quite like this anywhere else. My family grew up in West Virginia. My grandparents actually still live in the house that my great-grandparents built almost a hundred years ago. Their house sits on their farm, my family's farm, which is about 160 acres. The farm naturally isn't close to any other neighbors. The only things living near my grandparents were their animals. They carried cattle and calves, sheep and turkeys, and they also had two horses. The farm, their home, was just outside of Point Pleasant, in an even smaller town called Henderson. If you know the history of Point Pleasant, then you know it's a bit dark. It's also heavily embraced by the town itself. Just a few years after this story took place, the town had a giant statue erected in honor of the Mothman. You can say that this came with a mix of emotions, heavily debated, but ultimately, the town knew that it would be good for tourism, which is good money for a small town. But it's not all about the money. The true reason the statue exists is a bit deeper. In 2000, I was about 15 years old. I had been tending to the farm. Specifically, I was shaving the sheep and collecting the wool. The farm was usually pretty quiet, but having the shaver on, all I could hear was the buzzing of the thing. I was getting lost in the job, but I couldn't help but notice that all of the barn cats simultaneously ran out of the barn, like something had scared them. It was all happening very fast, but once they were out of the barn, I watched them scatter in various directions, taking cover under anything that was nearby. The deck, the trucks... The horse trailers. I turned off the shaver because this was unusual. I set it down, closed the gate to the sheep, and started looking around, listening. But it was the usual quiet of the farm. Even though I thought the whole event was strange, I decided to finish working, since nothing was obviously out of place. I figured something must have fallen and just startled them and that I could check that out later. I got back to shaving the sheep and was just about done when it began to freak out. Being very impatient and making the noises that sheep often do when they are in distress. I stopped shaving and looked around. All of the animals seemed to be a bit uneasy now. The cows were all beginning to make their way towards the fence closest to me in a hurried way. It's very unusual to see cows act this way. Fast, that is. They're rather docile creatures who sometimes don't even hustle when it's mealtime because they've been feasting all day on the grass. So why were they hurrying now? I watched as the cows tried to get the calves in front of them. Why were they doing that, I thought. I considered grabbing my grandparents, but before I even had the opportunity... I found myself witnessing something shocking. I looked back to the cows who were getting closer and looking more frantic. I saw something huge and black swoop down. At first, I thought it was a very large bird. But when I saw its massive size, its wingspan, I knew this was no bird. As it swooped down, it appeared to be swinging at the animals, swinging with arms. I knew that no bird in the world had arms in addition to this wingspan, but I didn't scream. Instead, I was silent and I contemplated what to do next. I was worried that if I started to run to the house, I'd be out in the open, prime for picking. So I stayed in the barn with the sheep who were all acting very strange. Then, the creature swooped down again. But this time, it grabbed a calf. It grabbed the calf with its legs. 
This thing had legs with sharp claws or talons connected at the ends. They must have been. How else could this creature grab a calf? Calves are, of course, smaller than cows, but they're still 75, 80 pounds. It was when I saw this happen that the creature's incredible size became more clear. The calf looked rather small in its grasp. Tears started to fill my eyes at this point, and I thought I absolutely had to get inside. I figured the creature was busy, its hands were full, if you will, so I ran for it. I could feel the tears escape my eyes from the wind as I ran, and when I reached the door, I looked back and could see the creature flying off toward the woods near the farm. I got inside, I locked the door, ran to the window, but it was gone. I must have looked like I felt, because when I found my grandma, she asked me what was wrong. She started to call for my grandpa, and once they were both standing there, I tried to explain what happened. Both of them were shocked and saddened to hear about the calf. She was a girl, and just about five days old. We cried for a moment, but I asked them, what the heck was that? What did I see? They kept trying to calm me down and tell me not to worry about it. But my grandpa, he had called his friend over, who was with the local police. They searched the general area of the woods, but they found no carcass, no bones, and nothing to show that an animal was attacked. But the calf was missing. I heard my grandpa telling his friend that he thought he'd never see anything like that out here again. That this shit was supposed to be over and done with. My grandpa was angry, and his friend was too. My grandma was quiet, but she looked very concerned. A few minutes after the police left, my mother arrived. She was there to pick me up. She wanted to know what happened, and I went to tell her everything. But then, my grandpa interjected with, It happened again. A calf this time. A whole fucking calf, Judy. My mom looked shocked, and then she looked at me, asking me if I saw what had happened. But again, my grandpa answered, she had to see the whole damn thing. Hell, it could have been her. She was just out there, shaving the sheep. My mom looked back at me and hugged me, but I sort of shrugged her off and looked at all three of them, demanding that they tell me what was going on. Long story short, my grandparents had lived in Henderson their whole lives. In that time period, they saw the Great Bridge collapse in 1967, when my mom was just two years old. It was a huge tragedy, and it is still for a lot of local residents. Lots of families lost loved ones that day. The other thing that took away from these deaths and the tragedy of the bridge collapse was the Mothman itself. News reporters everywhere took on the story. They even went as far as saying that the Mothman himself did this, or that he had predicted this. My grandparents say that in the beginning, no one in their right mind believed this Mothman story, until locals started getting together, discussing the collapse, and other strange things that had happened in town. Whether it was missing people, missing animals, things were going missing, and a lot of people were seeing the same thing. So the town started taking things a bit more seriously. My grandma told me that two of their friends had gone missing later that same year. No foul play, no leads, no bodies, just disappeared without a trace. Their farm had even been left as it was, with a hose running, as though they were in the middle of working when they disappeared. When my mom was about 12 years old, she too had been working on the farm. At the time, my grandparents also raised horses and gave lessons. My mom was a champion rider, 
so she spent most of her time with the horses. When this happened, she was out riding, basically just exercising the horses, when she saw something large moving atop the trees. Her horse must have noticed it too, because it stopped. When not in motion, she got a better look. It seemed to be the largest bird that she'd ever seen. But why did its eyes look like that? She had seen owls and other animals with reflective eyes, but this thing had glowing red eyes. You could even see that in the broad daylight. Feeling incredibly uneasy and knowing the legends that surrounded her town, she signaled for her horse to turn around and then to get the heck out of there, fast. She was racing towards the house, too afraid to look behind her. Her horse started to act erratically, and she was worried about getting thrown off. She held on tight and was almost to the barn when she felt something above her. She knew that she couldn't look up, and she just hoped that her horse would keep going. It did. All the way to the stables. Once inside, my mom quickly hopped off and began to make her way to closing the stable doors. She didn't see anything, so she thought that she must have gotten away from it, after all. But her horse was not acting right, still nervous, not staying still. She decided to head inside and grab her parents, tell them what she saw, and to help calm the animals. She was running around the house, trying to find my grandparents, but they were nowhere to be found. Suddenly, she heard the sound of wood crashing, followed by my grandpa yelling wildly outside. Then, a shotgun blast. She ran to the side of the house where the noise was coming from, and she saw her father pointing the shotgun in the sky. And when she looked up, she saw the black creature from the woods, but it wasn't in a tree. It was in the sky, flying away just as wildly as my grandpa had been screaming. The creature was pretty far away, but my mom said she could see it was carrying something. And it was two things, actually. Two turkeys had been swooped up. And when she looked over at the coop where they'd all been kept, the entire roof had been ripped off. I had so many questions for my grandparents, for my mom. After they told me the story, I confirmed with them that this is definitely what I saw, that I never got a good look at its face, but the body it was definitely not a bird. Luckily, I have a family and a partner who believe my story, not to mention a town full of people who would never call this story bullshit. They would never do that because they know someone, or they know someone who knows someone, that was somehow affected by the Mothman. Because where I come from, it's not just a superstition. It's fact. And it's when you start to forget about him, or you start to dismiss his existence, that he makes his presence known. And this is the true reason that the statue was erected. Sure, it makes for a good tourism stop, but more than anything, it's there to show the Mothman that the town does believe, to show him that we haven't forgotten and that we will never forget. Growing up without a father, 
but a close-knit family. My grandpa was everything to me. My grandparents in general were mine and my brother's world. Going to their house always gave me that before Christmas feeling. It's safe to say that by the time I entered the world, my grandpa had already had several health issues. Diabetes and previously suffered a stroke. Being a kid, most of these things were unknown to me, mainly the severity of them all. I would see my grandma stick my grandpa with needles, and I knew that he couldn't use his left arm. But none of these things ever seemed to slow him down. It's safe to say that his death officially rocked my world. You see, just before he died, our family moved to Washington State. So prior to my grandfather passing, I thought that this was the worst feeling that one could have, moving away from everything they knew or loved. My brother and I agonized over moving, truly not understanding why it had to happen, and probably making our mom feel terrible for her decision. As an adult, I know that my mom moved us for better opportunities. She was a single mom with two kids who was working insane hours at a hospital just to make ends meet. We'd been living in a very run-down area outside of Fresno, California, the town of Visalia. I don't know what it's like there today, but at the time that we moved, there was a string of heinous crimes that were going around against children and against pets, cats specifically. We'd lost two of our own cats to a literal cat murderer. My mom had kept these details hidden as best as she could and just started plotting our futures. Washington is definitely the place that I call home, but there were some struggles along the way. Making friends was not one of them at first. I made friends very quickly when we moved to Shoreline. We had a house and my aunt was moving in with us. And though I missed my grandparents, she was like the next best thing when it came to people I loved. Starting out great. Winter came, and for the first time ever, we got to see snow. A whole lot of it, too. As if to say, welcome to Washington, where seasons happen. The best part about this winter was that my grandparents would be coming to visit. The worst part was that at the time, I had no idea it would be the last time that I'd see my grandpa. I definitely didn't treat the man like he was sick because I really didn't know. I understand why certain details were being held from me. What I didn't understand is why my mom kept being so sad all the time while they were there. My brother kept asking if she's so sad, maybe we go back to California with them. He hadn't been filled in yet either. The thing is, it wasn't supposed to really be the last time. It was only the first time that my mom and my family was learning about his cancer. I think everyone was hopeful that he was gonna push through, sad but hopeful. Well, cancer sucks, and within only a couple of months of seeing my grandpa for the last time, he was gone. I remember sitting there while my mom tried to tell us what was going on, explaining that we'd be going to California for a funeral. I didn't know what that was. It's strange. Everything had seemed to change for everyone in my house, but I felt the same as I did before. That would change for me in a couple of days, but for whatever reason, when I boarded that plane, I was sure that my grandpa would be waiting at the gates when we arrived. The funeral. It all kicked in. Quite possibly at the worst moment ever. Even at a young age, my emotional connection to the people around me was strong. I was always the kid that was hugging the crying adult. For better or for worse, I usually joined others in their emotions. Often in an attempt to show them that they weren't alone. To show them that their pain was mine too. Even if I didn't fully understand it. Even days prior, as my mom cried and tried to explain that my grandpa was dead, I'd sat there and consoled her. I didn't know exactly why we were supposed to be sad, but I felt it radiate off of her, and I just wanted to soak it up like a sponge. We all filed into the church, and we took our places on the benches. It was quiet, and I had politely asked, probably countless times, where's Grandpa? 
surely yanking the heart out of everyone's chest in those moments. I started to observe the faces around me. The room was sad. The whole room was my mom on the couch that day. I felt something inside of me shift and suddenly, I knew my grandpa wasn't coming. I frantically looked at the front of the church. There was a big box and on top of it, there was this silly picture of my grandpa. He was sitting in my favorite chair and he had taken one of those long rope-like mop heads and placed it on his head, imitating a wig. But why was it just his picture? The first person got up to speak and it was my aunt. We all loved Denny so much. He was the heart of this family, she began. But everything was silent for me. I looked up at my mom. She was crying. My aunt was crying. Tears filled my eyes and I let it all out. The full realization that my grandpa had died hit me in that moment. What exactly was death? It had to be like our kitties, right? One day they were there, and now they aren't. You don't get to see them again, pet them again. So, I knew in that moment that I would never be held by my grandpa again, and I didn't understand how that was going to work. I was for the first time in my life deeply saddened. Naturally, the next few weeks, months, let's be honest, years, things would be tough for all sorts of reasons. We all had our own relationship with this man, and we were all trying to cope with that loss. To make matters worse, we had to move out of the house that we were living in and into a new city. A few months before this, we'd adopted a dog from the local convenience store owner, and we had to regretfully bring it back to him as the apartment wouldn't allow for dogs. The family was feeling low, but we ended up in Mukilteo. It was unlike any place that I'd ever lived, the nicest place I'd ever lived. And if only the kids there were as nice as the scenic views. I didn't make friends like I did the first time. I was the new girl who lived in the weird apartments across from the school. I was the new girl whose mom packed her lunch and it didn't look like everybody else's. I spent days crying in the bathroom, and I spent lunches picking chips out of my grapes because one of the girls thought it would be funny. She thought maybe I would cut my mouth open on it for some reason, and that would be funny to her. Apparently to a whole table full of kids, too. I hated this place. I cried every night and every day. I would hold my favorite teddy bear at night, and I would talk to my grandpa. Grandpa gave me Baby Bear when I was in the hospital. He wore this tiny little sun-made raisin shirt, and he was all I had left of Grandpa now. School had been rough. One of my only friends had moved back to Hawaii, and so I was back at square one of eating lunch alone and trying to fit in at recess. I'd been playing Foursquare with some of the kids, and this popular girl, if you will, had a new cool rain jacket. It was see-through, and it looked exactly like the one from Spice World. Anything reminiscent of the 90s, really. She was letting everyone try it on, and I mean everyone, even boys. Everyone had had a turn, and I was polite, waiting my turn, of course. One of the boys was running around with the jacket on, the girl asking for it back. He took the jacket off, and he threw it on the ground laughing and just running around. I picked up the jacket. I wasn't going to put it on without asking. I just wanted to give it to the girl. But she snatched it from me as I handed it to her. And as she did, she made sure to exclaim loud enough for everyone to hear. No, you're too fat to wear it. You'll rip it. I didn't want to cry in front of everyone, so I headed to the bathroom for the remainder of that recess. And that night, I was feeling about as low as a third grader could feel. I cried and cried. And just like every other night, I found myself talking to Bear, asking for Grandpa. Asking him to please just come and see me. Somehow, some way, say hi to me. I'd asked him, please, Grandpa, 
telling him that it was different this time, telling him that I just needed a hug. I laid there, tears rolling down my cheek, squeezing baby bear as much as I could, when suddenly I felt the familiar, warm embrace of my grandpa. I allowed myself to soak it in. I allowed myself to relax in my grandpa's arms. This was one of those feelings that was undeniable. I wasn't sure what would happen if I tried to talk to him in this moment, so I just let myself be, eventually falling asleep. I guess it's safe to say my family wasn't very communicative, especially at this time. So I never needed to tell anyone about that experience. And being the child I was, I was a little bit concerned that somehow, some way, it might hurt somebody's feelings instead of make them feel as good as it had made me feel. Not exactly logical, but not all third graders are. It would be several years before I would see my grandpa again, and of course, only ever in dreams. At relatively significant points in my life, though, the most significant being the week before my wedding, it was a lovely dream. Everything was how it should be. Everything felt so real. The idea that my grandpa was gone, it didn't cross my mind yet. We were just cooking, eating, laughing. Just the feeling that he was literally there and that everyone was okay because of it. My grandma was smiling. It was so beautiful, but then I had that feeling that I often do since I tried a lucid dream. Oh shit, I'm dreaming. This isn't real. This sucks, this sucks, this... And before I could spiral away in those thoughts, my grandpa hugged me in our dream. He told me not to worry. And when he said that, I remembered my husband, future husband at the time. He hadn't been in this dream, but he was waiting for me on the other side of it. I didn't have to worry. This same warmth and comfort that I'd experienced here, I'd found it again in the real world, and in a much different and special way. So I decided that while in that embrace, I would open my eyes. I was home. I looked at my phone, and it was my grandma telling me that she had just had the most wonderful dream. Yeah, we were there together. I can't explain it. The one thing I know, though, is that love is so strong. So strong that even when it's gone, it's truly never gone. Love is like our superpower. So no wonder it produces experiences that are nothing short of magic. Well, everyone, that's the end of tonight's show. But thank you for joining me. And be sure to join me every Friday night at 11 p.m. Only on neoretrofm.com. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda Darkest Hour at gmail.com or on Reddit, Amanda Jane FMN. Stay spooky.